You know, when they play that wretched anthem in the Parliament with the great big flag, you know, they stand ramrod straight to attention. They were busy. The, I mean, believe this or not, the Liberals and the Greens last week in that debate about Gaddafi want the EU to go to war. Anything to give the EU legitimacy. Anything to give the EU power. They are the nationalists. And they're not small end nationalists, they're big end nationalists. They are damned dangerous people, and we've got to stop them. So. Yeah, so you yeah, have mentioned the United States, but isn't the major difference between the United States and the EU or EOSSR that the United States, the United States have got the Constitution that even though they don't uh, do that much with it, the Constitution is limiting the competence of the federal government in the United States. Remember Mr. Ron, Dr. Now Paul, Paul says we are not competent, whereas the Lisbon Treaty, it's a treaty, it's not a constitution, for, because it is not protecting the people against the government, because that's the, the major goal of a uh, constitution. And when I was visiting Ireland before the uh, election there, I understood why they would say no, because they understood very well the EU is going to uh, put our way of living out of war, and they didn't like that. And hence, I prefer having a EU SSR constitution in order to be protected against government, because the present Lisbon Treaty, uh, if I got it right, right is self-amending. Yes. This means the EU SSR is competent for everything, even if they have forgotten it, they just add it and they are competent. And I'm afraid of that. I don't like it. I, would, I mean, I would agree with your analysis that, that in, the, in, the, in the USA, the states in the USA have, have a far greater deal of autonomy and self-government than the states do within the European Union. That is certainly true. And they have a very well-written and very well-drafted constitution, which, as you say, protects the rights of the individual. I have seen nothing either in the European Constitution or now the Lisbon Treaty, that does that. I thought one of the biggest jokes of all was the Charter of Fundamental Rights. You know, they're going to give us the... The EU are going to give us the right to marry and the right to work. I mean, I, I, I don't need some bunch of bureaucrats to dream this stuff up for me. We've had it since Magna Carta and before anyway. Um, but what was interesting about that was Article 54 of the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights said, in an emergency, we can take all of this away. So there was never any intention with the Constitution, nor with the Lisbon Treaty, that we should have any of this. Um, I think the, the Lisbon Treaty is effectively, you, you put your finger on it, sir, by saying it's self-amending, it is effectively an enabling act. It gives, it gives uh, the EU the power in what, it, in what it can determine to be a state of emergency to frankly do whatever it likes. And I rest, you know, I rest with my theme for this evening, which is that the EU is no longer undemocratic, it is now profoundly anti-democratic, nationalistic, and very, very dangerous. And, and, and I, again, we all come from different cultures and, and histories and backgrounds, but I mean, I've been brought up in the United Kingdom to believe that whilst we're far from perfect, one of the things that we've enjoyed progressively since 1215, since the 25 lords threatened to kill King John um, unless he put in place some proper protections for individuals against the state. I mean, I mean, that was the truth of it. They actually would have cut off King John's head had he not done it, and he did it. And, and we've grown up believing that the presumption of innocence before guilt was vital. We've grown up believing that habeas corpus was absolutely vital, that the state could not imprison you without charge or without presenting you, present, you know, presenting the body before at least a magistrate. And we've grown up believing that our right, if we're accused of something by the state or, or the prosecution service, our, our right to be judged by 12 good men and true of our fellow peers through a jury system was a good thing. And I now see all of those basic protections that we have had in the United Kingdom for the individual against the state being steadily eroded and destroyed. And I think it's a very sad thing. And, 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 and perhaps it is this belief in genuine liberty and genuine freedom. Uh, perhaps that's why it's the younger generation, as I mentioned earlier, 
in Britain and in France and right across Europe, it's this younger generation who perhaps have a rather more, who, 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 who perhaps nobly have rather more idealistic and optimistic aspirations for the future. It's them that are turning against, these, against this European state because they can see it for what it is. So, uh, you as a member of the European Parliament, do you think Turkey will join the Union? Uh, are we able to prevent it or do you think it will happen anyway? I've got a bet. I've got a 20 euro bet <laughs> with the Turkish ambassador to the European Union that Britain will leave before Turkey joins. <laughs> so we'll have to see. I mean, you know, in answer to this gentleman here earlier, I touched on Euro nationalism. You know, why is Europe wanting to admit a country, 98% of which is in Asia. <clears throat> you know, and we've even heard Barroso in some of his, in, in, in some of his wilder rantings, talking possibly about Israel and bits of North Africa joining the Union. They, 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 want, to, they want to build a global power. That's what it's about. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, li a little story about that. It, it's perhaps a bit of a story against myself because I should behave better sometimes, but there we are. And uh, it, it wasn't long after I'd been elected, back in 99, and I was hopping in a taxi to go out to the Brussels airport, and um, they put with me in the car a German MEP called Elmer Brock. And Elmer Brock, great big fat chap with a bristling moustache, um, just been done for tax evasion in Germany, but the European Parliament had decided that that's okay. That's okay, he can claim immunity. And Elmer Brock has been for 20 years a member or chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Parliament. He's a very influential Euro-Federalist. A, a man who, of course, coming from Germany, uh, could never ever talk um, about his own country because of, because of their guilt about the past. But Elmer Brock is ramrod straight, you know, to that European anthem. Anyway, <clears throat> I didn't be there a few weeks. Got in the car with Elmer Brock and off we went. And there was a, an absolutely stony silence. And uh, Brock sort of kept looking round at me and objecting to the fact that I'd even been born, I think. You know? <laughs> and Elmer Brock said, he said, you're ruining everything. You're ruining it. I said, no, Mr. Brock. You know, I have been put here by a segment of the electorate that think you guys are wrong. That think we should put all of this to free and fair referendums, and if you win, that's fine, and if I win, that's fine. But that's the way to settle this. He said, you don't understand. None of us, Britain, France, Germany, none of us are big enough on our own to be the world's global superpower. We have to be bigger than America. We have to be the number one. And it was wrong of me to say to a German, I bet your grandfather said things like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't help it. <laughs> but I mean, there we are. There is, a, there is an insight. There is an insight from somebody who has lived and breathed and worked within these institutions. I, you, know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not making this up. This is what these people believe. This is what these people want. They are bloody dangerous people, in my opinion. <coughs> right, okay. So. so I have a little question. Um, you said that the European Union is not to make it easy, a new country in Europe, for example, Flanders, in a couple of years. Yes, days. yes. I hope so. As long as two years, you think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things, if not the very first, is to organize a referendum about staying a member of Europe as it works now, or if it does not work now. And if they say, we don't want to continue like now, we get out of it. What would be the result of it? Or what would be... Well, I mean, there are some within the institutions who, of course, will always make dire and grave warnings that if you act against the union in any way at all, you know, they will stop trading with you, uh, you'll become a pariah state. Um, actually, none of that's going to happen, is it? Because business is business. You know, I mean, if you're, man in, you know, if you're a Flemish manufacturer of widgets, um, and I'm a consumer, and your widgets are good widgets, at a good price for widgets. Sir, I will go on buying your widgets, regardless whether you're from Belgium or from an independent, free, new, proud state um, in Flanders. You know, I will go on buying your widgets. Um, and similarly, um, you know, whenever I've asked this question about Britain's future, 
You know, I've been told by everybody, actually, in reality, from Neil Kinnock, God, I couldn't stand him, but never mind, um, to Tony Blair and all the rest of it, you know, if Britain wants to do something different, that's up to Britain. But the best answer of all to this was the great, lordly, godlike Giscard d'Estaing, who, when he launched the Constitution, said, and with this Constitution, back to the previous question, you know, with this Constitution, we will become a global superpower. And a German correspondent said, but, sir, a foreign policy, a European <coughs> army, a European navy, the British will never accept this. And Giscard said, ah, what the British need to understand is that unless they accept this Constitution, straight treaty, <coughs> they will be relegated to the status of a country like Switzerland. Do you know what? I thought, if you want to relegate me to the status of a country that is the richest in Europe, that has exactly the same terms of trade with France and Germany as we do whilst being members, that doesn't have to put up with 3,000 new laws a year, that doesn't have to pay 50 million quid a day as a membership fee to a club whose accounts have not been signed off for the auditors for the last 16 years in a row, and if you mean be relegated to the status of a country whose democracy is so open and free that they can hold their own parliament to account by demanding a referendum, I'm all for relegation to the status of a country like Switzerland, and it'll be the same for you. Good. Thank you. I'm done now. We just made one, and in fact, we give you a sort of following it, and maybe you'll uh, think of some men in the old archives, and maybe some years, maybe you'll remember it again. Um, my story is uh, trying to get out of the secret place. <laughs> 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 um, in 1990, uh, I'll also tell that uh, after the lecture, we'll have a little fight in the Capitol House. I think you all know the location. If you don't, you just follow me. And there we go. Right. Well, thank you.